am I going to hit record? No, that's the wrong thing. There we go. And I think that we are live, Tom. Tom <laughs> Bertrand. I, I don't do live. I don't do live, Vicky. You do do live. You yeah, do do. I love it. You I do do. And you said do do right out of the gate. So that's it. we know we're off to a good start. <laughs> I did say doo doo. This is going yeah. to make a double noise. Okay, there we go. I'll start drinking my IPA right now then. <laughs> mm. No, you know, nobody's going to show up for a while because they're used to me being late. And oh, is I'm, that right? Well, you know, when I do shooting the shoot, it's just me and them. Yeah. And so I'm very bad. Oh, oh yeah. You just do the live, take questions, it stream up. Uh... I, yes, I read the, I, I, it's not even questions, it's a conversation. It's really, oh, really? a conversation, yeah. It's legitimate shit shooting. It's, it's legitimate shit shooting. Wonderful. By the way, if anybody is joining us now, you should know in the next hour, you'll hear me use words you've never heard me <laughs> use on AFE or Dancing with the Stars. So you might want the kids uh, playing something somewhere else. <laughs> My favorite thing was when you did Women Who Write, um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that first man that ever did it, but you, uh, you were reading from your book for the very first time. I'm hosting right. as best as I can. And in, in the reading, you did something that your publicist did not want you to do. What was that, Tom? Um, swear? Was yes, it, you did. It? Oh, you most definitely. Well, swore. here's, a, I forget which chapter I read, but the one with the most swears in it is uh, The Adventures of Captain Spasm, which dealt <laughs> with my coming to terms with and ultimately thanks to uh, a, a wonderfully astute uh, uh, suggestion from my wife Lois that I managed to finally uh, get rid of back spasms. So that, that was, you know. Well, all right, now you have to tell the story. Oh, well, for uh, for a series of probably for a couple of years, I would say two to four years, yeah. I would have occasional uh, episodes of really severe back spasms. I mean, really debilitating pain. There, yeah. was no, there was no disc involvement, thankfully, but it was all muscle. But I ultimately learned that it was based on stress. Now, as someone who has meditated for almost 40 years, one would think that would deal with the stress, but it really didn't. Now, and, wait, uh, how long ago was this stress? Was this well, back? This was back when I was when the girls were still in school in Connecticut because we decided to keep them in their schools. Right. And I was flying back and forth doing both Hollywood Squares and then after 9-11, because I was doing AFE at the time as well, I, like many other people, didn't want to fly as much. So the company very graciously gave me a corporate apartment for my use in Santa Monica, which was great in terms of not having to fly back and forth, right. but not that great in terms of, you know, hanging out with your family. Yeah. Because, you know, we were now bi-coastal, Lois and the girls in Connecticut, me in California. And that I ultimately came to realize was the, the stress inducer, which was triggering. Now there was an initial, oh, we, we didn't plan on phone calls. I, I, I silenced everything else, but we didn't, hold, hold on. No, I can't answer that. So I, I, I take my, my oh, hold on a second. this is why, actually, this is why I love life. Honey, would you get that? Lois. So, <laughs> so anyway, there was an in initial injury where I was, uh, the girls were at a playground in Connecticut on a little merry-go-round and this other little kid came up and wanted to get on. Right. And instead of waiting for it to slow down, stupidly right. I said, here, let me stop that for you. And I reached out and stopped oh. it. And of course, all the centrifugal force, boom, hit oh. my back. It was like a guitar string snapping in my back. Oh. So that started, that injury coupled with the stress started the back spasms and all that. But what cured me, Okay. We were, uh, we have a place in New Hampshire. We were there. I was having another episode. It was over the winter. Uh, and, and I was I finally managed to get comfortable in bed, right? I was, it's just every movement. If anybody's had them, you know how debilitating oh, you, you, every movement can be uh, torture. So, uh, and I fully understand that those of you who've gone through labor, <laughs> this is a small violin thing. But, uh, but <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm now comfortable in yeah. bed 
And I think, oh God, thank God, I'm finally comfortable. And then I had to pee. <laughs> Gosh darn it. Had to pee. So I crawl on all fours oh. on the carpet, my loving wife at my side, and I I I oh. crawl towards the bathroom, towards the tiled bathroom floor. My fingers hit the cold tile and I go into spasm again. And Lois said something that changed my life. She said, honey, you can pee in the tub. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought there's no effing way I'm gonna be the guy who crawls into a bathtub and pees all over himself because his back hurts. So, and this is where my stubbornness kicked in. I stood up, my back spasming all the way, oh. and I started swearing at my <laughs> back. And those, and I actually cut down the number and and ferocity of swears in the book. <laughs> Lois read the initial transcript. She said, "I know this is accurate, but you can't put this many swears in." <laughs> Clearly, it wasn't my book. Oh, there you go. And, yeah. and so I'm standing up and, you know, and then I started challenging the back spasms. To, he's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to pick up my jeans, you son of a bitch. And I'd lean over and the back would go into spasm again. But I realized at yeah. that moment, and it, it, was a, it was an epiphany, I can be more stubborn than it can be painful. And I finally... Wow. I finally made my way to the toilet and I stood up <laughs> and I took a piss. Now, now grant you, the aim wasn't that great, but the moral victory was enough. You know, you would have had a much bigger target had you done it in the tub as low yeah, as but, but I would have, you know, I couldn't live with myself after you would have been one of those guys. Yeah, but that's love, isn't it? When you say to your spouse, honey, you can be in the tub. It's, right. it's, love. So, it's just so, us. Wait, how, how did you get rid of the back spasm? That really, I swear to God, Vicki, that was the first time that I realized I could endure because I had been shying away from the pain. Like right. when it would strike, I would contract. Right. Uh, and that was the first time I kind of expanded. Now, again, anybody with disc issues, uh, that's a different story, I think. But for those of us who have muscular pain right with, and i have i guess a slight bulge in one but there's a a, a, a dr john sarno uh yeah. who is just a wonderful resource uh for the mind body connection between physical pain and what's going on in our minds actually howard stern and i were taught when last when i was promoting the i'm hosting as fast as i can book uh, what 10 years ago now or 11 i was on howard's show and we were talking about tm which is the kind of meditation we both do and also John Sarno, because Howard had issues with back pain as well. And I'm Howard, having one now, so it's oh, really <laughs> ironic that well, I swear. You, go, my... go, pee, go pee in the tub. I'll wait. <laughs> we'll all wait tub. for you. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pee in the bowl. I'm gonna That's right. Bowl. That's right. I'm You'll gonna feel start. so much better. You'll feel so much better. So, so oh, this, this six degree, there's two degrees all over the place just in what you've said so far. First of all, around 2001, right at 9-11, Gabe was on, we were on our way to, to LA to, for the Emmys. He was writing for David Letterman at the time. And oh, okay. we were bi-coastal also. The kids and yeah. I were in New York and he was living. And the stress of that had it took a different toll on us than it did on you guys. You survived it. And we'll talk about your marriage to Lois for how many years? Well, we married in 82. So we're coming up on our 39th anniversary. It's just unbelievable. Okay, so yeah. now, and you got, okay, the last I remember you living back East, how long have you been full-time here? Well, uh, full-time here more is COVID related, um, right. but we've had the place here on the West Coast since uh, 2005, since uh, the dancing show, since Footwork with the Famous well. started back then. Uh, so, so, okay, so you're here, where are your daughters? Uh, they're both they're both here as well, but they're you know they're like many people kind of <clears throat> waiting for this uh, COVID cloud to lift so they can kind of get back to their lives. You know, it, everything's been put, sort of put on hold. Are they living with you guys? No, no. That's why I'm this calm. 
I love them dearly, but no, they're not living here. Okay, I know you have a Samantha. What's your others? I have a Jessica. Samantha. Jessica, Jessica and Samantha. Yeah. And how old are Jessica and Samantha? Oh, I, I can't believe it, but 32 and 30 now. How crazy yeah. is that? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Tom, let, we, let's touch on I the shooting the shit show that we were discussing earlier is uh, me and the COVID crazies. That's what we call yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Because we are COVID crazy. How COVID crazy are you and Lois? Like, what's your, how has your life been? It's been, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're good buddies. So that helps. That, that helps. We, we don't have any, you know, there have been, there have been no issues about uh, spending more time together, thankfully. Yeah. Um, but, but it, it's a matter, of, I like, I like routine, you know, I like to have some sort of routine in my life. So I kind of adapt to the times like today, usually every Wednesday, I'll go on a hike uh, uh -huh. in the area, you know, we, uh, my trainer and I went to Malibu today and, and then happily Paradise Cove is open for outdoor dining again. So we had brunch on the beach after a hike. So that was nice, but uh -huh. most mornings now, Mm -hmm. What I do, I get the New York Times uh, waiting for me on the driveway around six o'clock. I get up usually around six, six thirty, read the paper, do a little backyard workout. Which you are is, still reading a physical paper. And I will until they stop publishing them. I mean, I subscribe to a number of digital papers like uh, the Times, the Washington Post, uh, L.A. Times, uh, uh, Portsmouth Herald, because I love that area of New Hampshire. But yeah, I love that tactile feeling of of holding the paper and the sound. For example, there is a whole a world on YouTube called okay. ASMR, ASMR. And, and for anybody who uh, has ever gotten the sort of tingle feeling yeah. in, their, in their head, have you ever gotten that? Yes, that, like, I have. You're hearing sounds, someone's on a, like a, a computer keyboard or you're waiting in an office and you just hear the, the humming of work and suddenly you feel this little tingle. Mm -hmm. Well, ASMR is designed, all the videos and all the people who post videos on ASMR are designed to trigger that tingle. ASMR is an acronym for something, audio, sensory response. Why would anybody want to have the tingle? It's really cool. And at night, once the edibles kick in, <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> another reason I love California, by the way. Uh, once the edibles kick in, then the ASMR, uh, it, it, it just helps, it helps you go to sleep. My whole point being, you can get a half hour video of somebody just opening a newspaper. Just that sound. Really? Um, that triggers it? That, for some people, it works for me. Uh, when, when we were at our house in, in New Hampshire, uh, the, the one where I refused to pee in the tub, <laughs> one of the things that would help me go to sleep at night was I would turn on the cable access channel this was pre iPads and right on the cable access. And if the town council meeting in the next town over was on, yeah, it was perfect because it was all this low talking and shuffling papers and things like that. Right. And that would that they'd uh, I hate to tell them if they're watching, but you would knock me out. I would be <laughs> while well, you dealt with local community issues. <laughs> Lydia Cornell says she loves you, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Hello, Lydia. Everybody loves you. I'm not, I, I, I Not everybody. Let I me have, tell you, I did get fired. All right, all right. <laughs> Since we're here, we have to talk about it, Tom, because, you know, there's no way around that. That was the most, I, I, I don't know if it was shocking for you, but it was shocking. Not really, not really. Okay, I bet uh, you saw it coming. So you're going to tell yeah. us the story because shocking for us. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't really want to rehash it that much, other than to say that there Speaking had been. Mister. Yeah, I'll give you the I'll give you the Evelyn Woods version, uh, okay. the short story. I, the show had changed a lot for me starting in early 2008. It, uh, uh -huh. I, the show I left was not the show that I loved. Right. So uh, we had, you know, we had very clear, sometimes public. Right. Uh, differences of opinion about uh, the new uh, showrunner and some of the execs. Right. And, I, and, uh, and, and happily, I was at a point in my life and career where I didn't have to just shut up and take it. So I decided to, you know, um, to go public with some concerns I had at that time. Right. And, you know, I think that set the stage for it. But, but again, you, yeah, I kind of saw it coming. It was, uh, I, I just, 
the, the thing I felt bad about was that I felt like, um, from my perspective, I'm sure they might say something different, but I felt like Aaron was collateral damage, which I felt bad about. Did you, uh, do you, any regrets? Would you do it differently if you could? No, not a word, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, uh, you know, uh, going back to the summer of my final season, you know, I had a few lunches where things were kind of promised right. about bookings and such. And, and uh, then those things didn't happen or things like that. So, um, so yeah, so no, I have no, I have no regrets. Um, you know, I, I, I miss the people I care about. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought it would have been, I thought Aaron and I would have had a ball playing with the restrictions during COVID. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, we would have had fun with it. It wouldn't have been awkward. But right. no, I don't, you know, I had, a, I had a wonderful run. It was a great, great gift in my career. And, and uh, I have nothing but fond feelings for the very large percentage of time that I was there. And it was, a, and how long was your run on Dancing with the Stars? Uh, I did it through the fall of 2019. So right, when did you start? To, for a show, uh, June 1st, 2005. That's a long time. And, and long you know, I had a 15 year run that I uh, chose to end uh, on AFE, not because that, and that, that was interesting because that was a completely different situation yes. where I was the one who just felt like 15 years was, uh, a good run. I wanted to get the show to the 25th anniversary. And it felt like that show, like, I, I think I, at the time I likened it to Doctor Who. Uh, there are shows that benefit by turning over the lead every so often, mm -hmm. the, the front person. And mm -hmm. I felt that that was a really good time for me to pass the pinata stick on to somebody else. And I could not have been happier than to pass it on to Alfonso. That's what, so did you know before, for COVID, I can't, I can't remember what the timing was. Did you know before COVID that Dancing with the Stars or did it happen during COVID? Oh, no, no, that was last July. Cause they oh, wow. did a, yeah, uh, yeah, or, or this, where, what year is this? Yeah, this is- I, I don't know, but a, all I crazy. know is that I like yeah. most people stopped watching it when you left. Oh, I, I well, see now, and, and that's something, uh, I appreciate the, the, uh, the reason why you would say that. That having been said, however, yeah. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people that I love who are still uh, on that show, who I hope have long careers ahead of them. And, uh, and you know, I would encourage you to support them. You it know, lost I, its charm, Tom. Uh, you know, the thing that I, that I, I love most about you, well, well, there's many things, but oh, do tell. The, 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 the lines that they wrote for you couldn't touch what you did in real time off the top of your head. Your ad libs yeah. were being yourself. You know, it's interesting. Going back to season two, that was when I wrote about that in the um, hosting book. Um, it's when I, I went. I would run over to my book. No, 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 that's OK. That's all right. Um, I said to them during, I think, midway through season two, I just wasn't feeling comfortable reading scripted stuff because it was a live show and I wanted to respond in real time to whatever right. it was that I felt, whether it right. was snarky or sincere or whatever. And, uh, and so I, I went to the producers and, I, and, and they were a little nervous, but they said, all right, go ahead. And, and happily, uh, it all worked out great. So when there was a subsequent writer's strike, uh, one of my my greatest accolades was that a, a story went in, a, in the Associated Press that said, it doesn't appear that Bergeron is having any problem. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which in fact I didn't because I had been pretty much ad-libbing everything anyway. That's right. Uh, and, and there's a, a you know, good buddy of mine, Dave Boone, who uh, is a writer on the show, I think might still even be with it. Um, and I would confer, if I had an idea, I would bounce it off of him. Um, and he was always a great resource for that. But yeah, I just- But you were bouncing off maybe sometimes, but there were times I could see that yeah. was coming in the it was second. instant, and yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was, I mean, and that was the joy of it. That was the true joy of it. There was, uh, you know, just to, what I would do typically is meditate between the dress rehearsal and the live show. And 
just know I had this sort of visceral belief that whatever happens can be gold. It just depends on how I roll with it. Or what okay, so let's it. talk about that because you yeah. have, you were not a stand-up comic, but from what I remember, you did improv. Is that correct? Yeah, I did improv. Started in radio in my hometown when I was in high school. Yeah. Uh, and that's a great improv training, depending on the format of the station and how, you know, how flexible it is. And so many stations aren't anymore. Uh, right. They're all sucked up by conglomerates. What kind um, of radio were you doing, Tom? Were you... What were you doing on the radio? Oh, everything. It was, I, I used to joke it was Renaissance Radio because it was a local radio station and I would do whatever the hell they wanted me to do. Sometimes I, you know, I would just go to the police station to talk to the chief of police about whatever was on the wire for news. I would, you know, do the FM side, which was a beautiful, beautiful music station. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then, you know, do AM shifts periodically. Um, I, were, you you read, know, were you reading news? Were you? Everything. I was a DJ. I was a newscaster. I was an engineer. Bad one. Uh, <laughs> you know, what, but really whatever they asked me to do, I would just, it, it was, I was in heaven. I was working in radio when I was 17 years old. Okay. So how did that, was that the dream? Was that what you wanted to do? Was that yeah. your goal? Yeah. Yeah. Who were TV, your heroes? TV, Why did you TV, want to do that? TV was an accident to be honest. Um, yeah, radio, I just loved it growing up. Okay, so so what, 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 drew, what do you think drew you to that? Um, Here, well, you know what? I, here's what I think. And I, I, this, I don't think I've ever said this out loud before, but I do think it played a part. Okay. I'm a bit, I'm a bit of a loner. Um, despite my very sort of, you know, I'm on TV or radio or whatever. Right. Uh, talking to hundreds of millions of people. In my in my real millions, whatever you know, they lose count. Uh, millions of people. But I'm really kind of, uh, believe it or not, a little on the shy side and a bit of a loner. So radio was the perfect vehicle for someone like me to pretend to be gregarious, but I'm in a room all by myself. <laughs> that makes total sense, doesn't it? Yeah. It? I mean, it's kind of what we're doing now. I got my new microphone. I'm here at home. I, you know, don't have any pants. I mean, it's, you no, know, I do. I have my jeans on. But it, but I, if, if, if I'm to do uh, anything else in television, I think this is what it's going to be. I don't want to leave the house unless I'm going on a hike or to the gym or Starbucks. Uh, I'll host from here. We can green screen whatever I need behind me. Okay, but now uh, let's talk about that. I want to get back to the COVID stuff too. Okay. So this has changed everything. The fact that we can do this. Yeah. So absolutely. it used to be that we'd have to drive in traffic for an hour and a half. Right, right. Deal with parking. Well, I've come to your house to do a couple of these shows uh, in the past. And it was, it was hell getting there. But yes, I know. But and and my it was at five o'clock, seven o'clock. I had arrived in truck in rush hour. It was terrible. Yeah, so, yeah. so do you think that this is going to change the landscape moving forward? Now that we know we can do all of this, I think to some degree it will. I don't. I I, I think though that there is there's an energy that you can't duplicate in a situation like this when yes. you're actually with people uh, yes. in a studio. Um, so I think that uh, that it'll be a mixture of those things. Um, I think from a cost standpoint, a lot of shows, particularly the 24 hour news channels, will probably find that they save a lot of money by just making sure that their guests have a simple little setup, like, you know, a microphone and one of these ring lights <laughs> uh, right over your right over your head. And that's all you need, really, and a and a computer, and 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 you've got, you know, we've all seen it over the past uh, nine, ten months. In most cases, broadcast quality stuff coming out of people's homes. So why would you uh, spend the same kind of money? That being said, I think it'll be a mixture of of the two. There'll be shows like, you know, when Colbert can get back into uh, the Ed Sullivan Theater, uh, it'll be great. But he's doing a damn good job in the meantime. You know, it's it's remarkable what uh, he and Jimmy Kimmel and 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 Fallon have been able to do, um, you know, in the context of having to be in a corner of their house. <laughs> you know? okay. Did you hear about this? This is kind of crazy. So Drew Barrymore 
has a set has a set she's in a studio and, right and she will have guests there and they'll socially distance but she will also have guests that are not there but they put them there without a line and without any di differentiation so she had the three charlie's angels they were there and one of them was in california but you could not tell at all was it like when they resurrected Tupac on stage to <laughs> sing or you know you've got this hologram image of him is it kind of like that it was like a hologram oh, wow. cameron wow. diaz was basically a hologram in the scene and so Oprah like was coveting what Drew was doing, <laughs> um, which is interesting. But yeah, yeah I, I think they've made what people are discovering through creative imagination is how to overcome some of this. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I did. I hosted uh, a fundraiser for the Ed Asner Family Center Aww. in December, and it was a virtual reading of the screenplay of It's a Wonderful Life. Aww. So I, I was here in, at my house. Pete yeah. Davidson uh, played George Bailey. He was in New York. Uh, wow. Mia Farrow uh, played a few parts. She was in New York. Wow! Uh, uh, you know, uh, it was an amazing Ed Begley Jr. I mean, it was oh, a I great, yeah. great cast of people. Wow. Some of the, some of the, uh, the, the, the kids at the uh, Ed Asner Family Center also did role. It was wonderful. It was, okay. it, and it, it, you know, raised some good coin for them. And the technical uh, hurdles that they had to overcome with about you know 18 of us on various Zoom screens all over the country, and they and they did it, and it, it was wonderful. Yeah. Wow. You know, and that's something that I missed. For Ed, for example, I went to Ed's house, and he was in his boxer shorts and furry slippers. Yeah. And he got up and went to the bathroom during the interview yeah. and ate pizza and talked to his son-in-law and you know yeah. we're surrounded by all of his emmys and there are gazillions of them yeah. and that i met you know and i sat on his lap a little at santa yeah those little yeah. santa had on. you know so that kind of stuff and even when you were here you did this whole thing with my lights that was right. hysterical right. and you know i miss and and there's nothing like being face to face and have and there is an energy to that that there we, is absolutely absolutely but, but there is something to be said for not running all over Los Angeles. I yeah, gotta... and and for me, that's given me that opportunity to, you know, as I tried to devise some sort of routine for myself, I finally decided to get back to writing again. So I've been, you know, as I said, sort of slowly evolving this this idea for a novel. Something. Oh, we we've segued right into that. We're we're staying here for now. So yeah. Tom, what's the name of the new book? It's called Drive Time. Why? Uh, why well drive time is a term used for like morning drive afternoon drive in radio right sort of the most active uh lucrative times in a broadcast day right and and i'm using that as sort of a uh sort of a launching point because the the main character is going through uh an active time in his own life a time that will be ultimately fairly uh informative and productive by the end of the book if i pull it off the way i hope i do uh in his own life so drive time means a lot of different things it's a, a radio term but it also means the time in this character's life where things start to become clear and the future starts to look feasible for him how autobiographical is this well there's definitely a lot of uh sort of pulling elements of my own background Right. It, 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 it's, it definitely diverges from my, my own experience in life, but it's definitely, uh, it owes a lot to it. Let's put it that way. Well, yeah. Of course, we write yeah. what we know. That's of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I was told, perhaps, a little birdie told me that we might get to hear a page. Of it story. might have to be two, because I realized that at two pages, there's I'm a sorry, better... I'm sorry, Tom. I cannot accommodate you. <laughs> there's, a better, uh, there's a better dropping off point after two. And yes. coincidentally, I just happen to have some of it right here. Yes, okay. Well, this is very exciting. Is this the first time that you've read it aloud? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. All right, Tom, I want to remind you, I don't know if you remember, but the first time that you read aloud from- Of course I, I remember. Is, 
So that was a women who write, and you were the first man to ever do it. And we're going to talk about all of that. But well, anyway. that, and that is why it occurred to me to do this with you here, because, you know. I'm uh, your cherry breaker. You're you my, know? yeah, or, or I was your organization's cherry breaker, you're if you want to kind breaker. of yes. look at it that way. And, and subsequent to me, you had numerous people, including Carl Reiner, right? Coming, oh, yeah. God who bless Who also me. read from pages of his memoir before it was published. And yeah. you know, Carl published my book. Oh, and, that's right. That's and right. I, 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 Carl, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I was, uh, I'm going to name drop here for a second. I was uh, hanging out with uh, Dick Van Dyke and his wife, Arlene, and, oh. and we were talking about how we all wish that Carl had lived long enough to see Joe Biden win. Uh, because, he, yeah, because he was. I trust that he knows that, though. I trust I so. that wherever he is, he knows yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I have to admit, I, I think we go through this life and then pretty much that's it. So I would love you to know, think I'm wrong. I remember that about you, but I think you're wrong. So Hey, look, I, I will never be happier about being wrong <laughs> than on that topic. Um, yeah. You know, if, if when I finally check out, <laughs> some version of me blinks awake and and uh it's like oh there's more <laughs> wonderful <laughs> wonderful but you know i went to a, i grew up in a in a catholic family i went to a catholic school mm -hmm. and and you know i had the teaching that if you're lucky enough mm -hmm. to go to heaven for all eternity and praise god that's the real goal of your life. And I thought, how insecure is this guy <laughs> that I have to praise him for all eternity? <laughs> Seriously, can't we just say, hey, a high five, nice job with Hawaii, and then just move on? You know, it's like, I mean, how many hours are you going? Yeah, you're, you're great. Are we going to do this again tomorrow? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so I had issues even as a, as a kid in Catholic school. <laughs> All right. So Tom, what are you going to, are you reading from the beginning? Where are it's you? It's the reading? very beginning. It's the okay. very start. Yeah. Are you ready? Right. Okay. I'm, I'm giving you full view here. Let's go. All full, right. Here we go. Full view. Here we go. Drive time. I, I'm going to put on, I'll try not to get the, the, the ring light <laughs> in it too much, but I do need these without a teleprompter halfway across the state. All right. Here we go. Drive time. In retrospect, the most surprising thing about seeing her head resting on my chest was that I wasn't the least bit surprised. 63073, that was the night it all began, June 30th, 1973. Bud's party had been won for the record books. There were about seven of us there. I was the only one other than Bud from the radio station. The rest were his friends from, from, hell, I, I have no idea where from. They seemed unusually tight, like, people with years of shared stories tend to be, but what stories they recounted in my presence were almost deliberately vague, details omitted with knowing nods and head tilts in my direction. I soon realized I was the outsider of the group, the oddity invited by Bud for their amusement. This is the kid, he announced by way of introducing me. Didn't use my actual name, which is Dick, by the way, so the proper introduction <laughs> might have been worse. Cue the penis and Nixon jokes. <laughs> the kid was the nickname he'd saddled me with since our first meeting at the radio station a few weeks earlier. Initially, I resented it, particularly given the way he hit the K in kid with a hard huff. I couldn't decide if the nickname was affectionate or dismissive. In time, I came to realize it was probably a bit of both. We were only a few years apart in age, me at 18 and Bud somewhere in his early to mid 20s, but apparently decided that this gaping chronological chasm, his term, not mine, was sufficiently large enough that he decided to become my self appointed mentor, a decision probably fueled in part by the boss's directive that Bud give me a station tour. You're fascinating, he told me during that first meeting. I think we had known each other for about nine minutes. I am. He nodded slowly. Right out of high school, aren't you? Graduated in May, I said. College plans? Oh, not right away. Next year, maybe. Wanted to work for a bit, earn some money to pay for it. Uh-huh, he said, 
the slow nod again. He was making some sort of internal calculation about me. I imagined this was how cattle at auction felt, value assessment time. His eyes narrowed. Most kids your age don't get radio jobs. Who'd you have to blow? <laughs> My face flushed. What? <laughs> it was a setup. Relax, kid. I'm just kidding. The boss told me about you. You impressed him with your school reports. The school reports were a monthly recorded kind of a news show chronicling the goings on at the local high school. As student council president in my senior year, I got to review cassette tape auditions from classmates and then, after careful consideration, appoint the person who go to the radio station each, each month to record it. I appointed me. <laughs> About 30 years later, in 2000, Dick Cheney would do something similar after heading up a vice presidential search committee, ponder the merits of numerous applicants, scrunch up your face like you're thinking real hard, then pick yourself. <laughs> sure that I, blazing a self-serving trail of a small New Hampshire high school in the autumn of 1972, gave Cheney the idea, no doubt. Anyway, <laughs> welcome aboard, kid, Bud said at the time. We're going to have some fun. Little did I know how much fun, and that's it. Oh, Tom, you're, you're, Thank you're, you. a, you're a wonderful writer. You're a superb reader. Oh, I wish you'll do the audio book. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. If, if, it ever, if it ever becomes a book, we, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I'm only 50 pages in. Yeah, but you've, you've finished a book already. You know, having finished a book myself, uh, Gary Marshall's big uh, um, advice to us when he came to Women Who Write was finish. That yeah. is his word of advice. Well, a friend of mine uh, and uh, my, we co-hosted a wonderful show on FX together, Breakfast Time, back when FX launched, uh, Lori, now Lori Gelman. She was Lori Hibbard then. And she's, mm -hmm. uh, her third book is coming out and she, she'll send me the, the drafts as she's working working on them. And she's a wonderfully uh, funny writer. What a great writer. So I sent her the first uh, 47 pages and she uh, she encouraged me to keep going, which was nice. I, I, yeah, I just having heard too. I'm like, and you, uh, everybody's saying, I will buy it in advance, oh. buying the book. I love the book. You're getting applause. I'm trying Oh, that's to sweet. Thank you very much. Thank so you. I'm, I'm going to address a couple questions that I saw quickly yeah, when yeah. I'm going down the thread. One is, did you ever have to get bleeped on Dancing with the Stars for cursing, <laughs> Tony? Um, I don't. Bruno did. Um, oh, really? <laughs> but no, I don't. I don't think I ever did. No, I don't think I did actually. I'm pretty good. My my internal sensor mm. is is pretty good after all. By the time I got to uh, footwork with the famous, um, <laughs> oh, I was I I was I turned <laughs> I turned fifty that year. You know, so I, I this wasn't wow. my first rodeo. You know, right. I've been doing this for a while. Right. So, yeah, no, I don't think I was ever I was ever bleeped. No. Okay. okay, that's okay. So and the I, by question. the way, I deliberately came up to the the edge of it. Like one of our contestants. Oh, like what? Oh, give us an well, example. Well, one of our contestants talked about being bullied. Uh, yeah. When when she was uh, in in high school um, and and had you know a, a number of physical issues and such, and people were just mean, just mean. Yeah. And so I turned to the camera and I said, you know, if in your life you come across somebody who's got it harder than you, is dealing with a lot of challenges, I just have one request. I'm paraphrasing here, but this next part is a quote. I said, don't be an ass. <laughs> And the audience burst into applause. <laughs> and and I was I happy they didn't bleep it because I just I think, you know, that, but but that was a I that was very deliberate, you know. But, but there's uh, a fine line. When did that line shift that you could get away with saying the word ass? Because there was a time when you absolutely I don't know, fuck. but but to be honest, I didn't give a fuck. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> <laughs> but you knew that you were because I would say that lines blurred more and more over the last. Oh, I think so too. Like damn, you know, damn and ass and and piss. 
<laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't know how many of George Carlin's uh, seven dirty words now aren't that dirty anymore, but uh, yeah. I think I still, probably still, Fuck is still yeah. one you're not going to hear on network television. Here's the thing. The first time, I remember the first time I said it. I, in, I, I don't know how old I was. I was probably like eight or nine years old, maybe, in the hallway of my, my childhood home in Haverhill, Massachusetts. And my parents were both looming over me. I had probably done something that deserved some <laughs> punishment. And, and I remember saying the word like, oh, oh, come on, what the fuck? Thinking I had invented it. I thought that I thought that word, I must have picked, obviously picked it up somewhere, but I thought, and the look on their faces when little, little Tommy Bergeron just said that. <laughs> It was, it was amazing. And, and here I think, you know, I'm inventing this word. Why are you responding that way? <laughs> yeah. How do you know what it means? Yeah, yeah. It just sounds hard. good. It just, it's fun to say. <laughs> so speaking of which, supportive parents, were they? Yeah. Um, yes, to a degree. Uh, confused parents, because <laughs> nobody, nobody in my family uh, be it uh, the immediate family or extended family, mm -hmm. ever was in broadcasting or performance or anything like that. My dad was a, uh, a trainer at Western Electric. Uh, my mom was a uh, teacher's aide and worked, uh, in, 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 worked at a, a, a grocery store or a department store in the uh, accounts department prior to that. So, you know, this was completely out of their area of expertise. Uh, but my dad, they were all, my dad particularly was always very supportive, always very supportive. And uh, even when they would look at me like, where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> and so years later, when I was able to do it, uh, you know, when I was doing national shows, and now that they're both gone, the times that I flew them out here along with my mom's sister's brother and their spouses and you oh, know wow. we give them the full hollywood treatment take them to the show and out to dinner later you know those are uh, and we've now lost two of those uncles to COVID over the past year oh no so, yeah yeah so oh. yeah so it, it it made uh one was directly uh because of COVID. one we think it was a complicating factor and some other issues he had Oh my! But um, yeah, but so those memories are are really, really cherished now. The times that we were able to, you know, that I was able to kind of share the the whole Hollywood thing with them. Did you share the the Emmy thing with with your mom? Did did? No, I, I mean, stayed at my house. She's not allowed to. <laughs> no, I mean, did you t ever take your mom to like an award show or anything? No, no, I, I never did. We had mom and I had. Uh, a more complicated relationship. Um, but that. you know, one of the regrets, I have to tell you, it just occurred to me, one of the real regrets I had about the Emmy, about winning the, the Emmy for uh, footwork with the famous was, <laughs> was that I did not expect to win. And when, when uh, they announced my name, um, I just bolted out of the seat because this is the radio guy. I knew I had 30 seconds because they <laughs> drilled it into you before the show. If they if they call your name, you have 30 seconds. And and you know, I was prepared. But they don't count to... getting up to the stage, do they? <laughs> oh, I think so. I think they do. But I both if anybody goes on YouTube and just, you know, types in Tom Berger on Wins Emmy, you'll see me not so much as hug my wife, give her a kiss. I felt <laughs> terrible about that after. I just, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I bolted, woof, I was on the stage. And I think it was Seth MacFarlane who gave me the, uh, gave me the Emmy. Uh, but yeah, that, that's the only regret I have is that I just was so shocked that I didn't even turn and give Lois at least. <laughs> but it had, that had to be, all of it had to be very thrilling for your parents to see you have that kind oh, of Oh yeah, success. oh yeah. When, you know, when my dad passed and, uh, we, that was not that long ago. I knew you when you two, had that. 2005. And I'll tell you, Aaron Andrews was one of the few people who knew because it was on a show day. Oh. And Aaron was one of the only people who knew that he had died. I had missed the previous week's show and Alfonso had filled in for me because I wanted to be at my dad's bedside. And it was the only show I missed in the 
time I was with him. And, uh, and she was a rock. She was just because she, she had my back. And after, uh, you know, it was funny because I, at the start of the show, I thanked the viewers for all the lovely uh, messages they had sent me through social right. media about me missing the previous week. I didn't want to mention that he had died because I thought I'd lose it. I got through the whole show. At one t at t point during a commercial, one of the cameramen had found out who I was particularly close to, and he came up to give me a hug, and I went, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. And uh, at the end of the show, and I had no idea what I was going to say, and we were thanking everybody. We had done the eliminate a couple, all that stuff. And, and I said, you know, my dad loved the show. He watched every episode. And I'd like to think somewhere he's watching this one. And they put up a, a full card tribute to him, you know. And and Aaron and I, I'm a little choking up now. Aaron and I went to my dressing room and wept. Hmm. But was I, it, it's interesting, the performance head I was able to hold it at bay until right that moment. You know, it's sort of like when you've been on a big car trip and as you get close to your house, you really have to pee. <laughs> and it's almost like, why did, wow, I really got, oh, 10 <laughs> yards ago, I didn't feel this way. It was, it was like that. It was like, I had kept the emotions at bay. And the moment I unlocked it a little bit to at least acknowledge it on the air, right. Then I just had to get back to my dresser, but she was a rock. She was wonderful. That's um, some all right, Gary Collins Jr., the second or something. Gary Collins, I don't, it's not oh, the, Gary Collins from our magazine and all that stuff. And I, I think it might be Gary Collins Jr. or the second or something, but he's been asking incessantly, he wants to know Gary Collins the second wants to know about your relationship with Peter Marshall and if Peter oh. was a mentor or... No, he I wasn't. A, I, I had never met Peter prior to hosting the version of Hollywood Squares that Whoopi and I and then later Henry Winkler and I did. Mm -hmm. um, but when we did meet, it was wonderful. And, and he, uh, I, I, it was, I think, the final year of our version of the show, and he agreed to be the center square. Oh. During a week of shows. And I said to Henry prior to him uh, coming, once he agreed to do it, I said, we got to, we got to have him host again, one show. And I, you know, I, we can swap. And, and so Henry and Michael Levitt, who was the other executive producer, they presented that to Peter. He went for it. Um, there was this lovely moment that Henry insisted on that I'm so glad he did that I come down from the podium, Peter comes down from the tic-tac-toe board and we give each other sort of a handshake or high five. And he once again took the podium and hosted the show. And you know, that, that, that just, I think, so I would see him occasionally. He can't, he and his wife came to uh, footwork with the famous uh, a couple of <laughs> times. And, and, uh, and so- That never gets old by the way. Every I time know. I say it, I'm gonna laugh, so. Yeah, by the way, the. <laughs> The first time it occurred to me, I laughed. <laughs> um, but you know, I've I've seen Peter. Uh, as a matter of fact, the last time we were together was at the uh, daytime Emmys, and it was uh, we we did. He wasn't part of this, but Larry King, Regis, um, Marie Osmond, and Charo and I did a, wow. a version of Password. I played Alan Ludden in essence. And it was a tribute. Oh. It was a tribute to Betty White, and and, and oh. Betty came out at the end. But I saw Peter there, and we caught up. And again, when he he, he and his wife uh, would come to the show, uh, but just uh, you know, a, a, a wonderful guy. A, a, not only a, a a host of television shows, but a, a great singer, and and uh, you know, had an act that he performed until fairly recently, I think, mm -hmm. in clubs and stuff. Who were your heroes? Uh, um, Carl, Carl Reiner, Dick Van Dyke. Uh, you know, I've had the great good fortune. This is why, um, you know, I might I might share with you information about how things transpired, but you will never hear me bitch about how my career has gone, or you know, because I've just had such great good fortune to not only uh, take care of my family. Mm -hmm. But also to become friends with people that I grew up idolizing, like Carl, especially. Uh, getting to meet Dick Van Dyke through Carl, what a gift. I, I hung out 
when they did the Dick Van Dyke show revisited some 11, 12 years ago, maybe longer, uh, Carl invited me to come to the set every day. And I did. And I hung out and hung out with, I remember sitting in the darkened portion of the set with uh, Dick Van Dyke. And he told me the story of him first meeting Stan Laurel, who was an idol of his. Okay, and, well, you have to tell your, you have to tell your, oh no, it's a Three Stooges story you have. Right, oh yeah, the Stooges, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll get so, to the story, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and, and Dick was saying how he had opened the Santa Monica phone book and Stan's number was in it. And he called him and, and, and uh, he goes, uh, Miss Laurel's Dick Van Dyke. I know who you are, Dickie. I watch your show, <laughs> you know. And uh, and and so he went uh, over to the apartment, and they struck up a wonderful, wonderful friendship. And I, as I was sitting next to him as he's telling me this, I said, "Dick, you got to know that for me, that's what this feels like." You know. Uh, you know, it, I'm looking at you, Tom, and I'm thinking you could play Dick. Like if it comes to that, we did. We did a a. a, a, a well, what the heck was it? We were doing some goofy. Oh no, it was at Carl's house. One of the last times I visited Carl, I I did uh, a Dick Van Dyke kind of face, sort of a, <laughs> you know, that. It's and, perfect. And and Carl was just going to scratch in my head, and he was holding um, a, a book. I thought I had it here, but it's not handy. Uh, of how he uh, created the Dick Van Dyke show. So we were holding that, and I was. <laughs> hello, uh, hello, Mary Poppins. You know uh, that kind of. Thing. And several people in the in the comments said, "Is that is that Dick Van Dyke?" And, wow. and Dick, Dick actually said to me, "This was, you know, this was probably the the best tribute I, I ever got. I was hosting a roundtable following the screening of an HBO documentary called If You're Not in the Obit, Have Breakfast.' It's such a wonderful." documentary and yeah. it, it, it comes from a line that Carl had that in the morning when he'd get the paper he'd check the obits and if he wasn't in it he'd have breakfast <laughs> so we're on the press line and I'm next to George Shapiro who another one I was another just gonna say George, beautiful, I, beautiful. Love George. I love him uh, another TM guy another transcendental meditation as a matter of fact we were I, so many I, tangents I, on go on but we're at LA we're at LAX or JFK one of the airports going one way or the other and I didn't even know he was uh, waiting to board the flight. And I was meditating, uh, waiting to board the flight. And I opened my eyes and I looked over and there's George. He goes, you're meditating, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So anyway, so um, where was I with that story? I forget. You were talking about um, uh, Dick Van Dyke. You were talking about, oh, the, the obit. You were talking about the oh, obit. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. So in the press line, uh -huh. um, it, it was like me and George and Dick and his wife, Arlene, who's an absolute mm -hmm. doll. And so Dick and I were side by side and somebody was interviewing us together. And Dick said, and I could have, you know, could have basically cashed it in after this. He goes, you know, if they ever bring back the Dick Van Dyke show, he could play Rob Petrick. Oh, God. Because I, I was thinking the same thing looking at you. And I thought, you know what? I can pretty much call it a career right now. But then, you know, but then I became friends with him. I became friends with William Shatner. Uh, you know, it just uh, unlikely connections for a kid from Haverhill, Massachusetts, who grew up kind of idolizing these guys. Um, but Tom, it's been, I think that's something about, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, that's right. It, it's, sorry. Sparked, it's your show, Vicki. Well, <laughs> it sparked, but, but you're my guest. Right, but, yeah. you know, it sparked a thought because, um, you know, when I was a little kid, I wanted to be Johnny Carson because I wanted to hang out with go. my yeah. heroes and I wanted to ask them all the questions I wanted to know the answers to. To yeah. me, it seemed like the most, and, and I ended up, you know, being an actress, comedian, but this is really what I wanted to do. Yeah. And as a result of doing this, I have met almost all of my heroes, you included. And yeah, yeah. Carson and, is one hero of mine that I didn't meet. I got um, to be in his air. I breathed his air. I got him to watch him do the Tonight Show. And oh, he was, really? He was flirting with my mother and I during the taping, so it was pretty wonderful. I did work a lot with Ed McMahon, uh -huh. uh, who who was a fan of the FX show that Laurie and I hosted. Mm -hmm. And and then years later, when I was doing uh, volunteer work with the muscular dystrophy people, and and I I would basically do 
the overnight part so Jerry Lewis could get some sleep. So I would, it, sometimes the Muppets <laughs> and I would do from midnight to four or five, but I got to really hang out with Ed a lot in meetings ahead of the, and I would absolutely pick his brain about Carson and what it was like to, to work with and know Johnny Carson, because that was a style that I aspired to, that sense of that almost Marshall McLuhan calm, cool. It's a cool medium. He's so cool. He was so cool. And he was so good. And, uh, and, and so I would, oh, I got to tell you one quick story about doing the MDA telethon. So uh, it's the overnight hours, like midnight to five or six before Jerry comes back. Uh-huh. And there were all these, it was like a Fellini wet dream, the acts that they would book. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this one guy, now this is live television again. Right. One guy, Bob the Spoon. <laughs> Bob the Spoon, his act was he would play Flight of the Bumblebee on spoons of different sizes uh -huh. by hitting them. You know, and, and so the act finished. There were actually people in the audience at this hotel in Vegas and then it comes to me and I couldn't resist. I went, so I'm watching Bob the Spoon <laughs> and I'm thinking, what the fork was that? <laughs> Let's go to the tote board. <laughs> Can you find the mustard? mustard I didn't. Mustard? I said fork. Oh, fork. You said fork. Spoon. Spoon. Yeah, come on. Stay with me. Stay with I'm me. Sorry. Spoon. Fork. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just go right to the other. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Of course you did. Um. So, so a couple questions, new yeah, questions please. that have come up. So, do you have any reminiscences? You know. Okay. So, so here's the, the point that I was going to make. I'll segue to the question. Because of you being a host, I, I'm a host of sorts, and we get to meet all heroes and yeah. and get to know them and become friends with them and have relationships with them. What a gift that is. And as you did, I got to know Cloris Leachman. She came oh, to my home. God. Did her yeah. thing here. Anyway, she stayed in character the whole time she was here, only with me. And she oh, just really? glared at me the whole time and did the whole character. It was it was surreal. But I also got to watch the last picture show with her and Carl, the first time I oh met Carl, God. at Phil Rosenthal's movie night. And Jesus. Cloris was in her fuzzy slippers. Anyway, it was fantastic. But so do you have any stories from... Doing Dancing with the Stars with people like, Cl I mean, Cloris had to be a trip on dancing. She with was great. The stars. After, uh, after she and Corky Ballas finished one dance. Now, you got to remember, at the time, she was 82 years old. Right. right. She comes over to get her judgment from, you know, her judgment. and Carrie Ann. <laughs> and suddenly, I feel an ankle on my shoulder. Cloris had come over and with amazing dexterity, suddenly had one leg right up, <laughs> right up on my shoulder. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But wow. the last the last time I saw her was uh, not too long ago, a few months ago, when I mm -hmm. hosted uh, Ed's, Ed Asner's 90th birthday party. Uh, this was uh, pre-COVID, obviously, so it's more months right. ago than... Isn't it funny, the, the sense of time since this whole pandemic? Everything it, is either COVID I know. instead of before Christ and after Christ. Now everything is before COVID or after. Yeah, there you go. But if you go to my, my Twitter feed, somebody had sent me a little clip of the conversation between me and Cloris uh, <laughs> when I introduced her to roast Ed. And, uh, and it, it was pretty funny. I didn't know if it was going to go off the rails real quick or what, but uh, it was know, a wild card. Never knew with her, but um, it's, yeah, it, it that was a sad loss. Um, uh, Florence Somebody Henderson. Florence Henderson. Do you have oh, a Florence I was, Henderson? I was story? very close to Florence. Uh, and then you know we just lost Mary Wilson. Uh, what yesterday? And she was on the final season that I hosted that show, and, and she was one of my favorite people on it. So yeah. I know. I was looking at your Twitter feed, uh, at your Instagram feed as yeah. well, as mine, and we know a lot of dead people. <laughs> we know a lot uh, yeah, of I yeah. There are too many goodbyes. Larry King, there's a picture of me yeah. with Larry King with Mary, you know, uh, when when Regis passed. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's uh, that's yeah. what happens when you you get to meet your idols. You know, none of us get out of this alive. <laughs> you know? How about do you have a Florence story for us? Yes. 
Florence and I on, oh God, it's going to be easily a half a dozen occasions. She would come to the show after she was- Wasn't she like, kind of like a sexy, kind of provocative woman? This is what I hear about her. But I tell you, the first time I met Florence was on a show that was sort of a spinoff of the cable show I did uh, with Lori on FX. Right. It was called Fox After Breakfast. It was on Fox for a season. And in a lot of ways, it was- sort of be careful what you wish for. We hoped on the cable show that we'd get the nod to go to the network. But when, uh -huh. we, did, when we did get that nod, the executive who green lit it went over to Paramount for another job. So we were somebody else's project, uh -huh. which you never want to be. And so the, <laughs> the, the show that we had on cable got increasingly bastardized on, on the network. One of the, and, and Lori sadly was, was fired along with some other people who had been with me on the cable show. But the, the one bright spot was I got to meet a different co-host every week. And one of those co-hosts for a week was Florence Henderson. And it was a live show. And we were in this 6,500 square foot apartment in the Flatiron District of New York. And Florence's introduction to me and to the viewing audience was when she walked into the apartment and started whipping me with belts. <laughs> what? And I thought, we're gonna get along just fine. <laughs> wow. Yeah, Florence wow. was, she was a character, she really was. But in, the, in the, the dancing days, after she was a contestant in subsequent seasons, she would come uh -huh. and, and, and be in the audience a lot. And we would go out for drinks, the two of us. We'd just oh. we'd leave, because we, I, I bolted out. Uh, it was like a running joke. Uh, my publicist wasn't thrilled, but once the show <laughs> once the show ended, I was in my dressing room, in my jeans, out the door within ten minutes. While everybody else was doing the press line, my feeling was, you know what? That's about the couples. Let them get the attention. I'm going to the Whisper Lounge over at the Grove. <laughs> and and uh, and Florence and I would go over there uh, every so often and we'd just sit and have a drink and I would talk to, I would pick her brain, interview her about all the people that she had worked with over the years. I mean, she was just uh, just an absolute gift and, and uh, a sweetheart, just lovely, lovely person. And, and her death hit all of us really, really hard. It really did, because she had come to the show there's a picture of, I think, all of us with Norman Lear, who had come to that Monday show, and by Thursday she had gone, she had passed. Um, it's a yeah, so it's sort of like uh, just a reminder that uh, number one, it's a random universe, and number two, don't take anything for granted. You know. Indeed. Um, a, a bunch of people on the thread are asking if you're going to guest host on Jeopardy. No. I am not. Um, I appreciate the fact that I've popped up on some people's short list and things of that nature. I have to be completely honest. I have no urge to host a television show anymore. No. I all right, we have to get into this. All right, so let's talk about this. I don't. I feel like I've done it. I've done every format you can imagine, from talk shows to quiz shows to, you know, uh, whatever uh dance shows clip shows you got it I, i've done them um and it's been wonderful it's 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 been great uh but you know been there done that and uh so, actually the call uh when I, I i heard that alex had passed and what a brave what a brave man he was and how mm -hmm. magnanimous of him in the midst of his struggle to be that mm -hmm. honest to, to, mm -hmm. to reach out to other people who might have been in pain and mm -hmm. to try to help them through his own experience. I just thought that was, you know, whatever other accolades he got in his career, he deserves the most for how he dealt with that disease that ultimately took him. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, for me, it was the only time I was ever on Jeopardy. I was on a, a celebrity Jeopardy that uh, they shot in Vegas and I was horrible. I was just, I froze completely. I was great in the entertainment section, but right. at, one, at one point I remember going, Alex, my buzzer's not working. And he just very dryly looked at me and said, we hear that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it's not anything. I mean, look, whoever does it next, uh, you know, whether it's Ken Jennings, or I would love to see like LeVar Burton, 
mm. or Danica McKellar, who's a friend and is brilliant and extremely charismatic and LaVar, I think would be a great choice too. Mm. You know, someone who could bring a different kind of look and feel and spin to it. Mm. Uh, but they don't need a 65 year old white guy who's pretty much done anyway. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. You know, look, having said that, I'm, I'm always open to surprises, for right. example, and I'm not above, uh, I'm not above pitching myself to things. I've become, along with Lois during COVID, a big fan of several Canadian television shows. Oh, like what? Uh, Murdoch Mysteries. Mm -hmm. There are 12, the 14 seasons, we're waiting for the 14th to be available here in the States. We've watched 13 seasons twice. Okay, wait a minute. Where, what is this on? I, I need to know about this. Wonderful show. Uh, Murdoch Mystery set at the turn of the last century. So like nine, 1890s into the 19 odds. Okay. And it's on Amazon Prime. I think Acorn TV or something like that you get through Amazon Prime. So we started watching this and loving it. And you, because of social media, I would post whenever I thought a show was worthy of you guys binging it to help right. you pass the time during COVID. So I started posting about it and I started getting, we, then some of the actors on the show and oh. such, we all started following each other. So oh. I have a, I have a lunch date with the star, Yannick Bisson of Murdoch Mysteries. When he gets back from Toronto, he's up shooting a commercial, but he, I think one of their daughters is an uh, actor here in, in Hollywood. So yeah, we've been tweeting uh, or texting each other and we're going to get together for lunch and you know I'm going to hit him up for a role in season 15. I love uh, that so much. Uh, another show that I love is it's a situation comedy mm -hmm. set in Saskatchewan. Uh, they have six seasons, a movie, and now they're doing an animated version. It's called Corner Gas. And uh, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, it's a great cast, really funny writing. Uh, they, again, uh, I, I challenge you to stop after one episode. And I've become friendly with most of the cast of that show through social media. Um, another one, Kim's Convenience. It's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. It's set in a convenience store in modern day Toronto with a Korean Canadian family and it's uh, it's wonderful. So those are my three strong recommendations. If oh, come prepared. on. It doesn't get better than Schitt's Creek. If you're going to talk about Well, no. Oh, well, yeah. Sh but I think more, more people know about Schitt's Creek. They right. cleaned That's up at the Emmys. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to lead you to shows you haven't heard about. I love that because I haven't heard of any. I mean, look, Dan Levy hosted SNL this past weekend, and their ratings, you know, went. Of course. Uh, and and uh, Eugene Levy did a little cameo in it. Did you see that? Oh, I have it on, on the DVR. I haven't watched oh, it. Oh, good. So, but anyway, so that you, you don't need me promoting that show. That show right. everybody knows about. Right. But uh, these other shows that you might not know about really are quality uh, products and deserve uh, some. So, uh, Murdoch Mysteries. Uh, oh, Death in Paradise, which is an English show as well, which is set at a fictional island called uh, St. Marie in the uh, Caribbean. Uh, and that's got, I think, 10. I think they're in their 10th year. So those are all, all good shows. Murdoch Mysteries, Corner Gas, Kim's Convenience, Death in Paradise. I'm watching now for this. You're season. welcome. Happy, Happy Valley. Did you watch Happy Valley? No, uh uh, no. Oh, it's a British show. And yeah. Sarah Lancashire, who was also in Last Tango in Halifax, have you seen that? I haven't. Okay, these are two, these are gems. These are yeah. gems to binge. And uh, they're on. Uh, I'm, we're paying full price for uh, for Happy Valley. It's not on Netflix anymore. Oh, is that right? Yeah. The last yeah. tango is, and these are absolute gems. I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. There's just, I'll tell you, I was saying to Lois the other night, thank God if we have to live through a once in a century pandemic, we've got streaming services to make it a bit more palatable, you know, because- right. we, I mean, yeah. Think about those people in 1919, what the hell did they do? Yeah. What? And that's why there was the Roaring Twenties afterwards, because they all went nuts when they got yeah. out of I got a feeling uh, the, the next few years uh, of our lives are going to be pretty interesting, too, well, once we can all get back to, yeah, get back okay, to so traveling. Okay, so let's talk about COVID a little bit and how you and Lois are ha have handled the pandemic. You mentioned going to a restaurant. I have not been to a restaurant yet. Do you guys, uh, do you shop in stores? 
No, I, not really. I mean, most of this, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've become an Amazonian. I've, you know, I'm on Amazon all the time. If I need anything. The groceries, because I. That's, that's where I got this microphone, as a matter of fact. <laughs> no. uh, I, groceries, I have... yeah, I'll go to, I'll go to like Gelson's or Ralph's or whatever, <laughs> you know, but I, I'm, I'm really good about the, I've got a lovely mask collection. Yes. Um, and I have no issues with, with wearing it at all. Uh, but yeah, I'll do, I'll do like my trainer and I, after our hike today, she and I went to Paradise Cove and we, we had sort of brunch outside on the beach. Um, I saw your video where you're pulling yourself. Oh, that, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that, that was from a couple of years ago when I could be in the gym and yeah, I was doing some mime rope pulling uh, as an ab exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking you know, I gotta fun. tell you psychologically, yeah. it makes it easier to pretend there's actually something that can they can pull you up. I believe that. So speaking of mime, I know that Marcel Marceau is one of your heroes. And I believe you have a, more, a Marcel Marceau story, I experience. Do, and it goes back to that show on FX. Uh, I studied under a student of his. Wait, oh, you, you picked up your mic and you're, now your mic isn't as loud. Oh, it's not working. Is it? Oh, but I just bought it. Can't, is it all right now? Maybe it's me. All of a sudden, it seems like your your audio is a little lower, but maybe it's me. I'm, I'm going to do what they tell you on the IT crowd. I'm going to turn it off and turn it on. So let's let's watch together while I go mute. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm sure it's fine. Everybody out there, tell me if you're hearing Tom fine. Maybe it's just my. Stop. I'll stop uh, playing with my uh, equipment. Stop playing with your. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah. So I have done uh, the outdoor dining thing, and and I have. Well, now it came back. It just came back. Okay. All right. Well, you get what you pay for, and this was a cheap microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, I don't I don't have um, a, a real hesitancy about, and maybe I'm being stupid, but you know, I, I'm I'm re I'm real good about the mask wearing. You know, if if I'm having uh, a meal with somebody, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're outside, we're, we're somewhat socially distanced. Um, but yeah, I, I think Do you have I, people in your bubble, Tom, huh? Do you have people in your bubble? Like I don't have people in my house. Even my son hasn't been in my house. Oh, really? Yeah. Like our, our daughter, uh, our daughters will come over. Um, yeah. Like, uh, for example, uh, Christmas we had it was real we just had our two daughters uh, one of uh, their boyfriends and uh and a dog and that was it that was it are you uh have you been vaccinated um halfway there Me I'm halfway too. there what happened was and I didn't expect to be um uh, I've, I've done a lot of uh fundraising and such for the motion picture television fund here and, and their campus in Woodland Hills. And I was having coffee at Starbucks with one of the execs there. Mm -hmm. And she was heading over to get a shot. And she goes, you know, the, the unfortunate thing is sometimes the people who schedule these shots don't show up and we have to throw them away. Uh, I said, well, look, uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I granted I'm 65, but I'm in, you know, not with great health. I'm not interested in jumping lines or anything like that. If it's a, if it's a question of, are we going to throw this away or stick it in Tom? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and that's what, that's what in fact happened later that wow. day. I got a sudden call. All right, we're, you know, we're about to wrap up and so-and-so didn't show and they're going to throw it out. So, and yeah, so I, I went over and got the first of the Pfizer shots. How, how long ago did you get it? uh last was it last friday i think so i go back on the 26th for the second one have you had any did you have any side effects? just a sore arm uh, for about a day um i've heard that the second shot sometimes you get more of a sense of you know kind of fluish feelings yes uh and and uh a little maybe mental cloudiness but i've got that pretty much as part of my personality <laughs> anyway so i did uh, six but, hours in line at dodger at it, yeah, Dodgers. I was okay, so did you get your first? You I get got your first? My first, but no appointment for the second. They give you. Oh, really? Oh, they okay. You have to sit and sweat and white knuckle that they're going to send you the email to get the second. So yeah. far, people I know are getting the email. Right, right. So yeah, I, I, 
I was I was hesitant only until I was assured that it was really either you get it or we throw it away. Right. So, you know, that that became a no brainer in that case. But the idea of, of jumping a line had no appeal to me at all. Yeah. And has Lois gotten it? Yeah, she she was able to get get that because that you know, they had that and really they had two two left. Well, and so I had already left and I got another call as I was driving home. Uh, wait, we have one more. Would you think, Lo and Lois is uh, three years older than I am. So, uh, and she's had a, a series of issues with, with pneumonia. She's had it a few times. Mm -hmm. So she was definitely a, a candidate for it. So yeah, so she's, she got one too. So Tom, before we go, you don't wanna, you're probably not in the market to host anymore. You're 50 pages into writing a book. What you're a very creative and tenacious person. Yeah. <laughs> Give me more. So yeah. but what 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 else would you are there dreams still? Yeah, well, I I, I really want to finish this, whether it gets published or not, just as a creative exercise for myself. And then I I think I've decided I'm going to continue to annoy my new Canadian friends. I'm going to just, uh, you know, I'm going to keep annoying my Canadian uh, acting friends about showing up on their respective programs. I, I love this about segueing into acting. I remember the last time that I saw you, you had written a piece that you acted in that was quite wonderful, a short called The Messenger. Oh, I didn't write it. Ben Shelton, who directed oh. it, wrote it. But yeah, but uh, that that was, we did that a few a couple of years ago and I loved it. It was, uh, what was nice, one of the clauses in my contract uh, with uh, the dancing show that had a certain amount of money earmarked if I wanted to do an acting reel. And so I said to Ben, whom I had worked with on a Netflix film, the candy jar film. that yes. Helen Hunt, was Helen Hunt. Hunt. Yes. Um, I said, you know, I got this money and if I don't use it, it's sort of like a, who knew it's like a COVID vaccine. If I don't use it, it disappears. <laughs> and he said, well, I happen to have something. And, and he knew I wanted to go a little darker than people expect. Right. So there's a real burnout who's, job as a messenger is to deliver the information to people about when they're going to die. And if you go to my website, the aptly named TomBergeron.com, you can actually watch, uh, I think it's about, about a 20 minute pilot episode. It's wonderful. We, had, we had the whole universe of this character and, and, and the reality he was in and, and who else might exist out there all mapped out. We had a couple of great lunches, but you know, nobody bit, which is something that happens out here. So and just, Tom, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a suggestion to you. Yes. You don't want your next microphone, you don't want to buy from Amazon. You you want to get a blue microphone because your sound went out again. And it, it isn't just me. People are saying you did get low and everything. So your microphone kind of sucks, Tom. So oh, try what blue. I, what should I get? A blue microphone? Blue makes great. This is a blue yeti. And yeah. it's uh they're they're pretty wonderful. So yeah. Well, son of a bitch. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I, I guess my microphone decided it's almost time to wrap this up. Okay, so there you go. The, the microphone's given us the sign on the wall. Tom, thank you so much. I, I adore you so much. Well, the feeling's like, mutual. You're like the easiest person to talk to. Oh, and I'm going to be hitting you up for another video because it's Samantha's birthday too. So oh, just, absolutely. Uh, everything out to. there. Tom is the most wonderful person. Way before there was Cameo or any of that shit and you know, every celebrity getting on there and they're charging money to send your loved one little messages. And I'm not putting you down, Tom, if you do that, but- I do it for the SAG after COVID fund. But, I, I don't do it for me. I send the money off to them. Well, there you go. And you've always been wonderful making little videos like that from my promo stuff and for my kids and just, yeah. but you're just, um, you're just so easy to talk to and so lovely and so fun. And I'm just a big fan. Well, ditto, ditto. And I'll tell you, uh, like I said earlier, this is the way to be on TV now. Just sit in your house, drink some IPAs, talk to friends. <laughs> well, sounds good to me. Have a wonderful rest of your night. Say Thanks, hi to Vicky. Lois. I hope I, I get to meet her one day. She's camera shy. Former producer could talk the oh. most nervous people into being comfortable on television, but camera oh. shy herself. Well, there you go. Yeah. Take care.
Love um, you. Good to see you. Love you too. Bye-bye.